Lingua Britannica is a podcast that uses ethnographic interviews to study language use in the extreme metal community. We are studying a music scene known for its love of themes and topics generally considered offensive, and it is likely that some episodes will touch on topics or opinions some listeners may find tasteless or ethically problematic. Ethnographic researchers aim to adopt the interviewee's point of view so that we can draw out and study the attitudes, beliefs, and practices that are important to them. We want to make it clear that in presenting these conversations here, we do not endorse any of their content. Our aim is to explore the thought processes behind language use in this long-running, international and yet understudied scene. Welcome back to Lunga Brutalica with me, Jess Crook, and my co-host, Wes Robertson. Hello. Today we're chatting to Carl Schaefer about his work with Fallujah and his solo side project, Archaeologist. Welcome, Carl. Hey. Yeah, good to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Uh, so, start off, how would you describe the various projects that you're working on, both with Fallujah and your solo work mm-hmm. with Archaeologist? What kind of like metal genres would you say these fall under? Why? Give us the spiel. Sure, yeah. So, um, so you know, Fallujah is... Uh, you know, they've been around for long before I joined. So I joined Fallujah about two years ago, but um, they're pretty established at this point as being somewhere in the, I don't know, technical death metal genre on the more atmospheric side, I guess. But um, yeah, so that's that's Fallujah and we're working on new stuff for that too. And then Archaeologist has been my personal project since way before I joined Fallujah. And um, that one tends to be more all over the place. That's kind of my outlet for whatever I feel like doing at the time. So it's um, generally progressive rock or metal but um, kind of depending on the release, sometimes leans more, you know, heavier or lighter, proggier or whatever. Somewhere in the world of instrumental uh, instrumental and vocal, uh, progressive metal and rock, depending on uh, what's going on at any given day. <laughs> so what inspired you to start like a solo project like Archaeologist and what drew you to join Fallujah? Like, um, are these two genres kind of those that you have gravitated to in your own listening or uh, were they kind of more you stepping into something new, especially with uh, uh, joining um, a band that kind of had an established style like Fallujah. Yeah, some of both. So I guess um, before I started Archaeologist, um, I, I was always into progressive metal. That was always my favorite bands and, you know, sort of the scene I was uh, interested in. But um, but before I started Archaeologist, I had an indie rock band. And so um, that in college, this band I had, I was always the one playing indie rock shows, but wearing the Meshuggah shirts or whatever. You know? <laughs> it was like, I was always like a metal guy, but hadn't really... Um, figured out how to like play or produce it or stuff like that at the time. So, um, and I do love indie rock stuff too. So I, um, when my indie rock band um, ended because, you know, we finished college, everybody was moving away. That's kind of when I um, had had enough experience making music at that point that I was like, all right, this is the time to finally start my like prog metal thing, (laughs) you know, whatever that's going to become. So yeah, I was definitely um, very into the genre already before I started Archaeologist. And then um, Fallujah, which was much later than that, um, you know, it's like, uh, I feel like it has, it's pushed me a little bit more into the death metal side of things, where it's, um, it's like I got into metal through more of the prog side, whereas a lot of the people I know in the death metal scene came in through whatever death metal bands. So it's like there's um, sort of a segment of bands there that uh, I didn't really grow up on exactly, that I'm kind of learning <laughs> more of mm-hmm. it now. So it's some of both. It's like, definitely nothing new to me but i have gotten definitely deeper into the whole death metal scene since getting to know the guys in fallujah so did you start with just straight up prog metal or was there like an uh like steps towards that like where you just immediately it, it seems like a bit of a jumping point right because this prog has all those kind of like intricacies and stuff uh was sure. uh, did you just open up like straight up i don't know first first metal bands or prog metal bands M- more or less yeah like um even before that, like I was into a lot of math rock kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. There was always a little aspect of that, even in my indie rock band, just in terms of like messing with different time signatures in a more basic sense. Um, but yeah, I guess so. It's like I had, um, I had, you know, dabbled in some other music before that too and done whatever weird experimental stuff I could figure out how to do on my own, you know, while I was learning. But um, yeah, I would say I kind of went straight into the prog side of things just because that's uh, what I was into, you know. 
Hmm. And like, did the lyrical content attract you at all? Did like that play a role? Like, you know, in terms of uh, the kind of metal that you started listening to and then the kind of metal that you later produced yourself? To be honest, I would say it was secondary for me in terms of like mm. getting into the genre. Like, um, of course, there was plenty of bands I've connected with lyrically, but um, I, I, if I'm being honest, I would say that was secondary to just the the sound of things, you know, especially too with just um, a lot of my music over the years has been instrumental too. Mm -hmm. And so um, that tends to be sort of the first, uh, I don't know, just sort of what gets me thinking about the music first, you know, is the, I guess the instrumental side of things and then vocals after that, which is weird to say now because... Now, since joining Fallujah, I've transitioned into being way more of a vocalist. And um, I, of course, I do think a lot about lyrics, too. But but yeah, historically, getting into things, it was more the music than the lyrics that got me into it. So do you think joining Fallujah has made you like sp uh, spend a lot more attention to kind of lyrics and metal more broadly? Um, definitely, yeah. yeah and um, e even just in terms of my own writing process and stuff, too, like mm -hmm. the, the album I've done with Fallujah was um, by far the most uh, sort of like intentional and thoughtful I've ever been with my lyrics mm -hmm. where um, it's like in the past uh, before that too, it's like, it kind of depends on what the project is. Like there were, you know, I've done songs that didn't mean a lot to me and were about really specific things. And then I've had songs when I was younger that were, you know, it's not necessarily about something in particular. It's just uh, trying to put together words that sound cool, you know, but um, I would say I've moved away from that now to where I can say that uh, a lot of the stuff I'm doing with Fallujah has very intentional and clear meanings that I could actually talk about, you know, cause it's, I think it's something I realized was important more and more as I went through life, you know? Mm. And like, as you kind of like approach that realization, like, do you think you've like developed a sense of like what, at least in your opinion, makes for good and bad lyrics? Um, yeah, d definitely. Like, uh, maybe it's hard to like pinpoint specifically sometimes cause it's, it's hard to give like broad rules to what makes something good or bad, but, um, but yes, definitely. I mean, it's like, uh, I feel like you want to be intentional enough with your meaning to where um, you are, you do have something to say and you are expressing something that you actually uh, have some kind of feelings about, but at the same time, you don't want to be so specific that um, it's not relatable, you know? So there's, um, mm -hmm. it, it, for, for me, at least I find that there's uh, a balance to be found there with making music that has meaning, but is still has just a little bit of vagueness or abstraction to it to where, people can apply the lyrics in their own way to their own life, you know, so that it's not, uh, cause if, if I'm talking very specifically about my own life and the people and whatever is involved with it, you know, that's not as relatable, but if you broaden it a little bit by being a little bit less specific with things, I think, uh, it gives people more room to connect in their own way. Do you think there's a, a metal approach to lyrics? Like, do you think you can generally tell metal band lyrics from non-metal band lyrics? Um, sometimes, I mean, yeah, I guess, you know, sometimes you can, read the lyrics from a song and be like, that's obviously a metal song, mm -hmm. you know, but I think there's plenty of other cases where that's not true. You know, it probably depends on the band. Um, there's so much variety too, just within uh, different band styles. Like I can think of a couple bands that um, their lyrics don't sound like metal band lyrics at all, you know, at least not in terms of what you would uh, expect nowadays. So I, I guess it's, it's a sometimes kind of thing, you know? Can you elaborate on that? Like what makes a band not sound like a metal band? Um. Okay. So one, one that came to mind for me is, um, and I shouldn't say, sound like a metal band or not but mm -hmm. um like one band i can think of that kind of breaks the rule that i was talking about a minute ago with leaving things more vague is um warforged who i think you guys mm -hmm. talked to at one point mm -hmm. yes yeah, um, yeah i i thought the lyrics on their latest album were really striking that they were very unconventional like it was just a lot of um it was missing that uh, element of kind of vagueness in an intentional way to where i'm like this is like very weird and specific and yeah. um vivid mm -hmm. you know so it's um, and I, I think that's it's obviously on purpose. You know, a lot of people um, will sort of do things outside of the box for the sake of being more original and interesting. You know, so it's like it, it's almost hard to talk about rules or what's typical or what's not because you know it's it's all done in the context of what other people are doing in the scene and kind of um, building off of that or intentionally diverging from that. You know, but yeah, but Warforge is one that I thought of for that, especially with the new album. Oh, yeah, for sure, definitely know what you're talking about there. I think, uh, yeah, we 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 found their lyrics also to be quite, um, I don't know, the unique peculiar for, I guess, everything we'd seen. Uh, like it yeah. felt, it felt like kind of a, a Bukowski kind of like, like yeah. on the street perspective <laughs> that they had, which was very interesting. Yeah. I remember we right. both laughed at some of the, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. There were a lot of laughs in that interview. I think yeah. just based on like some tropes we hadn't really seen come up before yeah. previously. And, so. Well, and that's the thing too, is there's like an element of, um, kind of like absurdity or humor in mm -hmm. it, you know, which mm. is, um, also a little bit different from, a. Uh, a lot of like the very serious 
typical metal vibes, you know? Sure. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And you're like, that's not (laughs) serious at all. You know, that's a crazy thing to say. Mm. Well, fortunate that you say that, because that actually links really well to our next question, which is about this kind of ongoing debate on the podcast about whether or not extreme metal um, should be viewed as escapist fantasy and entertainment or like a genuine reflection of the artist's own views, politics and identities. So what would you say your position is on this? I think it totally depends on the specific writer. I, I think there's tons of examples of either one of those, and it just depends on what you know each particular band or person is trying to express. But I, I think it's the genre is broad and open enough to where um i think it really accommodates both all right well then okay, moving straightforward into, yeah sure <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah just, just, again I, I can think of examples of both you know it's like when you talk about escapist fantasy type of lyrics i'm like that definitely exists you know mm-hmm. the fans that do mm-hmm. that and then when you talk about things that are um you know the op- whatever the opposite of that is i guess in terms of uh being not fantasy being very real and very personal and um direct with like their lives you know i think there's lots of examples of that too so yeah i think uh luckily the genre um kind of allows for both so the way we kind of designed the questions for uh your own specific lyrics is uh, we're going to start with some kind of intro stuff focused on archaeologists and then move into fallujah uh kind of because you you started with archaeologists as well um but Across uh, the archaeologist, uh, 15 releases is like a 50-50 split between releases that have songs <laughs> with lyrics and those that are entirely instrumental. That's so right. <laughs> just fundamentally, uh, how do you decide when to include lyrics and when to leave them out entirely? And uh, how does the decision to include or exclude lyrics impact the form and function of the songs that you write for that band? Yeah, great question. Um, the real answer is that I've... Uh... I, I like doing a lot of different things and I like listening to a lot of little or a lot of different things. And um, the direction has just changed many times over the years as I, you know, I, I there's no big plan, basically. Um, it started out with vocals. Uh, the first couple of releases I did um, all had vocals and that was um, sort of my intended direction for the project. And then I think what sort of mixed it up was um, I had one release pretty early on, uh, which was the Odysseys EP which um, I decided to do an instrumental album just for the sake of doing something different, I guess. Like I was listening to a lot of instrumental prog stuff like Pliny, Animals as Leaders, things like that. And um, I don't know, I just thought it'd be cool to try something as what I saw as um, sort of just like a sidetrack, do something different for one release and then go back to the regularly planned vocal releases. That was kind of my intention with it at the time. But then that EP got a lot more attention than the stuff I had done earlier. Like that was sort of where... um, I don't know, just got kind of more established with that. And then when I um, got a live band going for Archaeologist, which was after that release, it seemed like anybody who knew Archaeologist knew us as an instrumental project just because that EP had gotten more um, sort of attention from that. So I I don't know if I leaned into that side of things a little bit more from that one. Um, But uh, my my long-term vision for the band has always been to have vocals and have that be like the main version of archaeologist with instrumental stuff as sort of um i don't know even like a parallel sort of timeline (laughs) to the other music and so um, i did just put out an instrumental album recently um which is something that i've been meaning to do since odysseys which is like follow it up with a proper um you know full-length instrumental release um but i think it's the last time i'll do that because it's uh again it's just more about you know, I've just had that on the back burner for a long time. I like, always wanted to make sort of a sequel to Odysseys, but really I, I see the project as having vocals long-term and everything I'm working on for it after that has vocals. But um, yeah, just just depends. And I guess there's been other times too where um, just the nature of uh, the project led to instrumental stuff. Like for example, one of the more recent archaeologist releases is a soundtrack I was making for a video game. And that one, you know, just instrumentals made sense. And uh, mm. since there was sort of a precedent for instrumental releases to exist with an archaeologist i thought it wasn't that far out you know to where it's like it's another instrumental release it's not that weird so it's, it's just really been one step at a time kind of with different circumstances as i go um but I, I do intend on bringing the focus back into having vocals in the music and having that be the long-term direction if i can manage to stay uh focused and consistent enough to do that uh, what's the reason for that? Like, so why do you want to like kind of move away from the instrumentals, given that that's what you've become more known for? Um, I I just like music with vocals, first of all. Like, even though, um, hmm. again, it's like I tried the instrumental stuff, um, and you know, maybe I'll totally change my mind and do more of that too. Um, I, I do enjoy that, but I would say that 
despite that still what I enjoy the most, um, the biggest chunk of what I listen to is music with vocals. And on top of that, now being in Fallujah as the vocalist, I've just, I find myself spending more time practicing vocals and working on vocals to where I think it's um, pushing me more as a vocalist. Just nowadays I spend more time, a lot more time doing vocals than I do playing guitar, Mm. um, which is just kind of one more, one more reason. And then beyond that too, it's like I have songs that I recorded four years ago, five years ago with archaeologists that do have vocals that are intended for future releases. Just, um, yeah, it's just, uh, just, just more what I see the project identifying as long term, I guess. So hmm. you're kind of moving towards um, like preferring vocals rather than songs without in your own kind of art form? I think so, yeah, overall. Does that affect like your view of kind of old stuff? Like, are there songs that you've written for archaeologists where you go back and you're like, "Oh, I kind of want to add vocals to these," or like, like, or or do those still stand as um, a sonic yeah. statement? Yeah, not so much because I would say that. Um, so one thing is like, I when I'm working on the music from a very early stage, I know if I'm intending it to have vocals or not, mm. and if it's going to have vocals, I'm kind of leaving space for that intentionally, or at least imagining like, okay, there'll be vocals here. Versus um, with instrumental stuff, I'm way more likely to feel like um, like this section needs something to fill in like the missing layer that would be there for vocals, you know. So I'll tend to do more guitar lead layers or more um, sort of melodies on top of the music. You know, like I'm less likely to leave a section that's just sort of chords or something where I would normally let the vocal be the focus. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that since the instrumental tracks were all intended to be instrumentals, I sort of um, set them up as such and filled them in with enough um you know content and layers whatever to make it interesting in my mind as as a standalone instrumental um so yeah I, don't, I wouldn't say i have any like um second thoughts about the stuff i did put out instrumentally but the one thing i will say is that um for better or worse i feel like it's uh it's made it harder to uh, like tell people what archaeologist is or like <laughs> have people understand <laughs> you know because the answer is that it's just my project for like the only thing that ties it all together is the fact that i'm the one working on and writing it all you know, and so it's like somebody asks, what type of band is this? I'm like, well, it kind of depends, you know, on the thing, which on one hand, <laughs> I think that's, you know, it's cool for uh, having more variety to offer. But at the same time, it's hard to like just show it to somebody. You know, I imagine it's mm -hmm. easier to get into a band when you're like, I understand what this band is and what they're doing. You know? mm. So, um, so yeah, I, I do like the idea of keeping a more focused sort of direction on it, especially with uh, I feel like all of my favorite bands it seems like they know what they're doing <laughs> from the start, you know, and like <laughs> w w whether they change or not, it seems like one very consistent evolution. Whereas archeologists has just jumped around left and right. And so I do like the idea of trying to rein that in a little bit and uh, focus things in one direction, which I, I think will be, uh, you know, like more vocal centric stuff. Okay. Hmm. Well, lyrics that you have written for archaeologists, um, such as those on volume one and two of your EP and Winter's Wake as well, seem to describe the experience of someone who had great expectations and hopes for the world, only to be kind of confronted with the devastating reality of humanity's self-destructive tendencies and impermanence on the planet. Um, so we could be wrong here, but like lines, um, like from yeah, the first two EPs. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> oh, okay, great. <laughs> Well, yeah, we kind of like gathered this from like lines of the first two EPs that read, um, you thought you had it all figured out until everything came crashing down and burn in lifeless self-defeat of what you will always be, uh, forever incomplete for um, what you have done to me and time will slowly burn our temporary future, temporary earth. And then on Winter's Wake, this theme of inevitable death and destruction continues in lines like illusion starts uh, starting to fade let the rising waters wash uh, wash me away and falling through my darkest days reason and truth have been lost along the way um i followed you to this lonesome place what will we do when there's nothing left to save um so yeah so we are getting this thematic thread kind of right um and if so yeah like why do you think it appears across like different releases with kind of distinct musical styles sure yeah um yeah that's that's pretty spot on um i, I will say that um honestly with the archaeologist stuff so so volume one, you know, obviously was the first one. And um, at that point, I was definitely still kind of figuring out what I wanted to do with the band and what my lyrical style was going to be and everything. Um, I, my point is that volume one is, um, I would say, definitely less, <laughs> for better or worse, definitely less um, deliberate and meaningful and intentional with the lyrics than some of the later stuff. So like volume one, I think there's a couple songs I could point to and say, oh yeah, this song has some kind of message, a real theme. Honestly, there's some songs on volume one where it's like, 
I wrote this uh, song in the back of my engineering classes in college and just <laughs> writing down words that sounded like they would go together <laughs> into a song, you know. So um, some of the songs are like that. Some are more meaningful. But on volume two, on the other hand, I wanted to sort of uh, correct that a bit and be more deliberate with it. So, yeah, volume two is all about death in different forms and um, about you kind of nailed it with the uh, your first description of it, just sort of like uh, being becoming aware of your own mortality and dealing with that mentally and emotionally and um, coping with that and like coming to peace with that eventually in the end. And so um, it sort of explores different uh, themes relating to that concept overall, kind of starting off more bleak and ending more in um, sort of like an accepting way, just ways to view the whole um you know, phenomenon or whatever you want to call it, um, ways to view it in a more like accepting manner. Why did you choose mortality as a topic? Like, um, we, so I guess I'm just thinking, cause the last person we spoke to that, that built an album around like mortality and the fear of death, um, was, uh, uh Mirai from Psy. Uh, but he's like a grandparent. Uh, you know, he mm. was saying like, you know, and he, he's up there as parents, he said it passed. Uh, you're obviously quite a bit younger. Um, like, I imagine that that the the perspective, you know, with like a forty fifty year old fifty age gap is is pretty large. Like, why why investigate more? What is what? Not not why, but like, what inspired you to investigate mortality um, while you're still, you know, young and and healthy and yeah. I I think um, I think I just found myself having more to say about it and more like thoughts to sort of reflect on it with it because it's like even if there was nothing. Um, imminent it's not like i was had like dealt with a close you know death in my in my life or anything like that um i think it's just so universal that it's like something that everybody can relate to and understand and it's like even if you're not close to it you just um you're aware of this inevitability in the future you know whether it's far far off or not or whatever mm -hmm. and um i think i just found it as something i could talk about in a real sense um especially having not gone through anything um super dark in my life <laughs> honestly you know it's like if, if sure. you've gone through like um like real struggles and um sort of darkness in your life like you can probably um relate to these things in other ways but um that that was just one that i found that it's like it's like yeah you know i'm doing fine <laughs> everything in my life is fine but like st still here's this um darker thing that i can genuinely mm -hmm. relate to and um think about you know and um universally can cause some sort of uh fear or anxiety or whatever you know for for everyone did you feel that the topic of the album because it is like a kind of metal project had to be darkish like was that a little pressure there um not so much pressure just as more that i think it sort of naturally aligns with it in a sense you know it's like the if the music is somewhat dark and aggressive um it just makes sense to match that tone i think to an extent you know um or if it's not dark then at least uh at least be like serious you know sort of vibes like i, I wouldn't have like fun lyrics <laughs> you know mm -hmm. on um on songs like that um so yeah not, not so much pressure i think it just uh i probably naturally like aligned with that for the reason that a lot of other people naturally align with uh that sort of tone in the lyrics with this type of music sure mm. well <clears throat> speaking of kind of differences in, in musical styles that we kind of alluded to earlier it is pretty clear that different releases and even kind of different remixes of your releases uh, present very different musical styles ranging from, you know, even uh, including like 8-bit, right? Um, so <laughs> obviously not all of these releases like feature lyrics as we've already discussed, um, but if we look at the two examples that we mentioned earlier, so Volume 1 and 2 of your EP in Winter's Wake, we, we can see two kind of distinct musical styles that I'll let you kind of define. Um, but if we're looking at the lyrics from these releases... We did notice some differences in the language, which we assume are kind of linked to these differences in, in subgenre. So, for example, if um, we look at both the EPs and the albums, uh, and the album, um, they both reference animals. So the animals from the EP include um, vultures and a snake, um, and, and these are kind of real animals, whereas lyrics from Winter's Wake include more mythical creatures, including a siren right. and a leviathan. Um, additionally, lyrics from a song like Unforgiving Skies of Volume 2 of your EP mention literal skies and a saviour, um, but those from Winter's Wake um, specifically reference Our Sleeping God and Devils by Your Side. So are these differences in style and kind of subject intentional? And to what extent do you think they are connected to the differences in musical style? 
Yeah, great question. I would say, um, so you're right that there are differences in sort of the the style and like sort of the the world I'm trying to encompass and like put the lyrics in. Um, I don't know if it's so much because of the music style, but um, th there are definitely reasons for it. Like Winter's Wake, for example, is very directly inspired by um, a handful of different like more fantasy types of media, like um, a handful of like video games and things like that, that um, where it's where it's not, I wouldn't so much say it's directly based on the stories from these things, but I'm very much inspired by it and was thinking about these things. So yeah, Winter's Wake is um, definitely like some sort of fantasy story in my mind, you know? Um, whereas that's not really a place I was coming from on some of the other lyrics. It probably started with um, just trying to uh, make lyrics more interesting by having them be relatable visually, um, you know, just sort of um, being more descriptive and um, yeah, just more imagery in the lyrics, I guess, I think always makes things more, uh, I don't know, more interesting, I guess, you know, like you're just a way to sort of make things more colorful um, in terms of whatever, it's making you uh, imagine when you listen to the songs. So it's um, volume one. I, I don't think there was any real obvious meaning or direction there. But um, then volume two, like we kind of said a little bit earlier, is um, that that's very based in the real world. Um, like the you mentioned the song "Unforgiving Skies" and some of the lines from that. Like uh, that one is very um, specifically based on um, a kind of a tragic accident that went through um, or that some people at so it's this thing that ha I don't want to get too far into the details of it, but um, it's this thing that happened to some people I knew in high school where it was this whole tragic thing and people died. And it's um, very much based on that, on this like one specific event, um, like a plane crash, basically. Um, whereas like Winter's Wake is just, <laughs> you know, it's based on fantasy video games. So, so you're right that there's, there's a big difference in the tone and sort of, um, uh, you know, subject matter you would have in there. So kind of taking this all together when, right, when you knew that you were going to uh, join Fallujah and start writing lyrics for them, uh, how did the, the things, the skills or the, the approaches that you developed for archaeologists influence, um, you know, your initial idea of, of what you were going to do writing for a new band? Yeah, it, it definitely set me up well for it. And honestly, the timing of um, when I got to audition for Fallujah happened to work out really nicely with uh, sort of where I was at with archaeologists. Like, because um, the, the Fallujah album is by far the most um, sort of just like deliberate I've ever been in terms of like kind of holding myself accountable to making sure each song has an actual meaning. You know, like there's something I'm actually trying to say with each song which as I've kind of said, it's like with archaeologists, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, <laughs> you know, and the, the further back you go, the more likely that there's, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm trying to put some imagery in the listener's head. I'm not necessarily trying to like throw some kind of um, real strong idea out there. But um, when I, right before I auditioned for Fallujah, I was already working on some archaeologist stuff that I, I still haven't gotten around to finishing, but I will at some point, where one of my um, sort of goals with it was to be very, um, just have a very clear idea of what each song's about and what I'm trying to say and like some kind of strong message to it. And so I was kind of in that mindset already and trying to sort of um, push my lyrics more in that direction and really hold myself accountable to that, you know, and not have it like if somebody says, what is the song about? I don't want to have to say, oh, it's just uh, just words that I thought sounded cool and I just put them together, you know, <laughs> and it's, it's about whatever you want. I was like, no, each of these songs is going to be about something. And um, so I was, I was kind of working in that uh, sort of headspace already when Fallujah hit me up. And um, it just aligned with what they're doing too, because um, it's like on the Fallujah album, a lot of the concepts were things that um, our guitarist Scott came up with, mm -hmm. or like we, we we would sort of have these sessions where we would just write down ideas for like, what if we have a song about this or this or this or whatever? Um, we just had this big list of ideas, but a lot of those conceptual ideas were from Scott. He's like, what if we make a song about this? And I'm like, oh, that's a cool prompt. Let's uh, you know, let's go with that idea and I'll build lyrics around that. Um, but uh yeah it just sort of lined up for that reason it's like i was ready to do that anyways and um you know I, I think it's a bit harder to put more meaning in your songs you know and not um just let it sort of fill in with you know whatever random content you want to put in it but um yeah just that aligning with the fact that scott had all these very specific ideas for concepts just really uh fit together so can you tell us a bit more about like what happened when you joined the band with lyric writing? So the, the concepts a lot came with Scott, but like when you were sitting down to actually write the lyrics, did you like reference their old albums? Was there like a pressure or kind of a, a desire to continue 
like a, an approach that had been done before? Or was there any like specific conversation with the band of like, hey, you're now our lyricist, uh, you know, you have complete freedom, or hey, we'd like you to create a through line. You know, what what led to the actual process of you sitting down with a pen and paper or you know word processor or whatever? Yeah, I would say there was never like a clear um, like. Uh sort of requirements set to me in that sense. But um, I think we just agreed on those things. And like, of course I did spend a lot of time going through the old Fallujah stuff and really getting more familiar with the lyrics and um, trying to sort of match that tone. Cause it's like, you know, like we're talking about earlier, it's like some music is more escapist fantasy. I would say Fallujah is more on the um, generally more on like the, I guess it depends actually, but generally I think it's more on like the more real emotional level, especially on their um, later stuff, like on their last few albums. And so that's that's more what I wanted to connect with, you know, where it's like it's not like uh, violent gore, like death metal lyrics. You know, it's more um, lyrics about some sort of personal struggles or, um, you know, evolution or things like that um, about like, you know, real, real feelings uh, that people relate to. And so that's that's definitely something I wanted to capture in the new music. And um, I think it's something that the other guys and myself sort of just agreed on anyways you know it just made sense to go in that direction which is where probably where i would have wanted to take things anyways hmm. um well so far you've written um lyrics for the latest fallujah album empyrean um on on this album um there are some familiar themes that we saw in lyrics for archaeologists namely death and destruction that appear on um every song of your album captured in descriptions of effigies of my destruction moving through the horizon, um, down into the blackness of death, being already dead and gone and observing as unstable ground starts to break down and the degeneration of all mankind. In addition to these kind of more familiar themes, um, we also saw death position in relation to rebirth, um, as in lyrics to songs uh, Radiant Ascension uh, and Embrace Oblivion and artifacts mentioned being reborn um, and being back where we've begun. At the same time, we saw motifs um, we didn't observe in the archaeologist lyrics, including that of being away, um, moving far away or leaving something behind, evident in lines like transmissions failing, uh, I'm so far away, and you could slip away in death um, of 1,000 days. It's time to reemerge, abandon all we've, uh, we came from and start again, and still calling through the endless night so far beyond my reach. So how did you land on these themes? And, like, you know, I assume this is in part, like, influence of Scott, as you mentioned before, but what's the significance? do you think of talking about death and destruction in this way uh, that's kind of different to how you've explored these themes in your work with archaeologists? Yeah, so um, you know, so Empyrean, the latest Fallujah album, it's a it's it's not a concept album, like there's not one overarching thing, but the the closest thing to a recurring theme is uh, sort of this idea of rebirth that you touched on. Um and uh and that that's for many reasons. Like one, just sort of the the, the timing of it and the things that uh, the band was going through and that each member of the band and the world at large, like having just come out of, um, you know, going through COVID, going through lineup changes, members going through totally unrelated struggles in their personal lives, um, you know, trying to finish this album with uh, people coming and leaving. Um, this idea of rebirth sort of applied on many different levels, I think. And um, so, yeah, like you said, that Radiant Ascension, Embrace Oblivion, um, even the first track, the, the uh, Better Taste of Clarity, um, there's this real theme of sort of going through some kind of darkness and finding a way to the light out of that. And that's sort of what we wanted the direction of the full album to be, too, in the sense of, like, it starts in this more, um, on the sort of, in the depths of, like, this uh, sort of darkness and struggles you're going through, and then ends in a way that, um, you know, overcomes those in some sense, or at least has survived them and grown stronger in some way. So sort of transcended those uh, struggles. So it's like, even though the album doesn't stay on this one path the whole time, that's, that is sort of the overarching direction of it. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, it just, it sort of ended up um, popping up in a few different songs in slightly different ways, just because I think that's, um, it, it just seemed like, uh, you know, because I, I, I think you want some kind of subject matter that people will relate to, but that also is coming from a place of, um, you know, like a genuine place in your own life as well. So you're not like uh, pandering, trying to write lyrics that people relate to. You're like, here's something that we actually are feeling and going through that people will be able to connect with. And I think this idea of um, surviving changes and, um, you know, rebirth is the more sort of exaggerated way to look at it. Um, I think that just ended up being something that we had a lot of thoughts and feelings about. 
I, this thought just popped in my mind, and I apologize because I don't know how to frame it as a question. So I'm just gonna like make a statement, and then like I don't know, you can <laughs> respond. Sure. Uh, I just realized it's it's interesting that like your your early work, right, that we talk about with archaeologists, started around the theme of mortality, and then your first work with Fallujah is about rebirth, which is kind of like the opposite in a way, or like at least like a a way of getting past mortality. Um. Sure. So how how about that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's yeah, kind of both. That. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's kind of both too. Like that's definitely still present um, on Empyrean. Like mm-hmm. it makes me think of the the last song in particular, Artifacts. Um, that song is completely about um, wanting to sort of continue your own um, path, your own legacy, whatever it is, by sort of leaving something behind long after you're dead and gone, or you know, whatever, however you want to express that. Mm. Um, and it's a uh, you know, it's it's definitely in the context of mortality. It's like, even if we're not very specifically talking about that, it's about wanting to build something in whatever way you personally relate to that um, will have some kind of lasting impact or remain in the world somehow after you're gone. And so it's like, uh, it sort of goes, you know, the subject matter kind of takes it a step beyond just, um, you know, accepting mortality, but that's a very big part of the themes in it, I would say. Okay. Well, in terms of like the actual language style that you use for writing all these lyrics, uh, we did notice that you often like you do use kind of mono or bisyllabic words that are familiar to most speakers of English, like um, lines like "never forgetting that I've lived inside a dream," "sinking slowly," "fragments of my mind keep overflowing." That's all, you know, pretty straightforward. Um, mm-hmm. But about once per song, you include one or two more uncommon multisyllabic words like "eventide," "malignancy," "effigy," "symbiotic," and "cognizance." Um, so I'm wondering, like, why does this pattern exist? Like, why is there kind of a, a peppering of, of a few trickier words in each song? Um, and is like, is there an intent to balance out difficulty with accessibility? Um, would, you know, if, if your songs didn't have a few big words here and there, would there be some kind of effect that is lost? I, I think so. Yeah, exactly. Um, that, that is something I do spend a lot of time thinking about is um, I'll find myself sort of putting myself in a corner with lyrics where it's like, okay, this is what I'm trying to express in this phrase or this couple of lines or whatever. Um, but I, I'm pretty strict about holding my, especially nowadays, holding myself accountable to um, uh, sort of keeping rhyme schemes and trying to incorporate a lot of alliteration and like inner rhymes where I can within lines um, where it's like, I don't want to sacrifice the meaning, but I, I will definitely lean into, um, you know, rhymes or near rhymes or at least replicating vowel sounds more often to um, sort of build with that. So um with those two goals in mind, having like a, you know, keeping a focus meaning, but also um, locking in more tightly with, um, with sort of these uh, patterns in terms of like the rhyme schemes and vowel sounds and um, alliteration. Um, a lot of times big words are like the missing puzzle piece <laughs> to make that work. Um, so that that's one part of it. I mean, I, I have a thesaurus and a rhyming dictionary open pretty much all the time when I'm writing lyrics. Like I go through a first phase where I'm uh, just sort of brainstorming kind of stream of consciousness like here's everything i can think to say about this topic here's just ideas or words that i could see growing into more fleshed out ideas you know just get all these things down but then when i'm actually putting together full lines yeah i have a thesaurus and rhyming dictionary open all the time because a lot of times it's like it's not like it's words i didn't know but it's maybe words that weren't the first ones to pop into my head to where i'm like oh this is a less common interesting word it has a little more color or flavor to it you know um that isn't so abstract that it's going to confuse the listener, but um, just uh, makes the lyrics sound a bit more, um, I don't know, less, less elementary, I guess, a little more advanced, a little more thoughtful. And um, often again, like um, is sort of the missing piece to fill in these rhymes. Cause it's like, e- even if I want to have, um, you know, rhymes or that sort of thing in the lyrics, it's like, I don't want to do a bunch of like single syllable, obvious <laughs> rhymes, you know, like, we're going to rhyme lie with die and try. It's like, no, I'd rather have vowel sounds that um, sort of flow together in a more poetic way, but uh, aren't so obvious or like the first idea that can pop out of anybody's head. And so, um, yeah, th- I think bigger words end up uh, helping with that a lot. I mean, we were going to ask about rhyme and stuff later, but I guess just while we're on the topic, I, why is all this important to you? Like, why is it important to have rhyme, to have alliteration, to have words that are a little bit bigger? It's just what I end up liking. It's like, it's almost hard to objectively argue for it, you know? Um, I, I can think of examples too of, um, I mean, I, not off the top of my head, but I know there are examples of uh, 
bands where like the lyrics aren't rhyming but it's not bothering me <laughs> you know i'm not like uh i'm not like oh that would be better if it rhymed it's just you know it comes off however it comes off but um i just find that that's what i end up liking and kind of gravitating towards for for whatever reason you know i'm i'm sure uh i'm sure you could kind of psychoanalyze it <laughs> but um, it's not, yeah, our, it's, not our jo- yeah not our intent no yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no it just ends up being what i think sounds cooler pretty much all the time you know and like once in a while i'll break that where i'm like uh I'm like, here's exactly what I'm trying to say. I don't want to filter that through any sort of um, sort of lyrical lens in terms of like, this has to rhyme or fit the syllables or whatever. Um, sometimes I'll break that and just say what I'm saying. But um, more often than not, I find that if I think about it for a little bit and um, try different options, I can usually have both. I'm like, this says, this conveys exactly the meaning I'm trying to say. And then for whatever reason, my ears like it more because the syllables <laughs> line up or fit in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, keeps the same kind of flow and uh, sounds more lyrical, I guess. But yeah, it's it's not really something that I would tell people they have to do in their own lyrics. You know, it's like kind of do what you want. But I've I've found that that's what I prefer. And even though it's harder to, um, it takes more time for me to write like that. It's just always what I end up finding worthwhile. Can there be too much? Like, can you can you put too many big words into a into a song, or like too much rhyme? Or, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, um, for example, uh, yeah, I mean, for for both of those. Um, and again, it depends on what you're going for. Cause it's like, there's plenty of, uh, death metal. Like, even if you look at like the first Fallujah album, it's like very, um, sort of scientific sort of language, you know, like a lot of like words that you wouldn't really see outside of a biology textbook or something mm-hmm. like that, um, in rapid succession. So it sounds very, um, I don't know it's more it, l- less personal, more sci-fi or something, I guess. Um, it's, which, and if that's the vibe you're going for, you know, that's, that's cool too. But um, I find that, you know, I, I tend to not go that far into the like vocabulary to where I don't want it to feel like it's being intentionally um, inaccessible, you know. But um, yeah, the other end is totally possible, too, where like, or I guess you were talking about the rhyming. Like, uh, yeah, I do try to avoid having every line in the song rhyme because I find that that's not something that I am doing for the sake of serving the song. It's something that I fall into out of the sake of like, here's the most convenient thought for my brain to come up with next. It rhymes with the previous line, which rhymes with the one before that. So I'll, I'll intentionally be like, okay, that's enough uh, A sounds or E sounds, whatever. Like all of these lines are starting to blur together. Like let's switch it up and intentionally, like sometimes I'll even build it around. Like this is the syllable we're going to go with for the, um, or, like the vowel sound we're going to end lines with in the next verse or whatever, you know, or intentionally do like um, instead of just each line rhymes, maybe like a, you know, um, like A, B, C, B type of rhyme structure or something like that, or change it up. Because again, it can start to sound um, like a nursery rhyme if, if <laughs> everything is too straightforward. Um, so there's there's just a balance there. And, every, you know, I think it's about finding your own place where you want to land on that spectrum and being aware of uh, what sounds the coolest to you. And then um, not being afraid to like take the time to make that work. Because a lot of times it is just like a difficult puzzle to solve where you have to scrap the idea you're working on because you're like these... So it's just not fitting or it sounds too basic or too complicated or whatever. But yeah, totally possible to go too far in either direction, I think. Hmm. Well, like speaking of your actual like kind of word choices, we said earlier that like, you know, you have this kind of balance between um, more, you know, complex, uncommon words and more, you know, quote unquote, accessible words. Um, but even if we like were to focus on the language use that is generally more accessible, it's not really what we would call colloquial language. Um, for example, lines like beholding my true design uh, and I'm lost in the eventide um, could probably be reformulated as looking at what I really want and I'm gone in the evening in colloquial speech, right? So sure. why do you think you tend to move away from familiar speech in lyric writing? Like what's the effect of using language that actually contrasts with everyday speech? Yeah, I guess there's two things. One is that um, within sort of the structure of a single song or a single album or whatever, sort of uh, however far you want to zoom out and look at it, uh, I try not to repeat myself too much. So like, for example, if I use some uncommon you know, word that seems more interesting to me that um, just more evocative for whatever reason in a song, like I'll avoid using that same word in other songs, you know, like, especially if it's something very striking um, and like uncommon, you know, like that's an interesting word choice. Um, you know, I, I I don't want to repeat myself. So that's one reason it's like, I'm constantly trying to carve out these new paths of uh, like, what, what are new ways to say maybe things I've said before or themes I've touched on, but you know, I don't want to have lines that sound like they were taken out of another song. And so maybe that's part of it too. It's like, as time goes by, I've, I've used more and more of the simple lines that 
naturally pop into my head to where I'm like, let's not do that. Let's try to do something different. And so I end up uh, going for things that are a little bit less common and um, less obvious, I guess. Hmm. And um, I guess the other reason too, is that uh, a lot of these words end up being more, um, I don't even know what the word for it is, just more interesting, like aesthetically in terms of the, like phonetically, you know, in terms of um, like, even if you, didn't speak English or like know what the words were saying. Some things just uh, fit more naturally with um, what the vocals are doing. I think especially with like screaming vocals too, where certain syllables lend themselves more, um, more easily to like high screams or low screams and things like that. Um, like a, a lot of times I let the, uh, the vowel sounds kind of shape the ups and down flows of the, uh, of the vocals in terms of the actual pitch of the screams and stuff. And that's not like as a hard rule, but I, I just find that that tends to happen somewhat naturally, you know, to some extent where E sounds are going to probably swing a little bit higher and O sounds tend to go a little bit lower often. Um, so that's part of it too. It's like just uh, incorporating these different uh, patterns of syllables and vowel sounds um, ends up uh, affecting the music too, which is just one more reason to go to less common words sometimes. Mm. Do you think there's anything about the metal genre specifically that elicits less common words? Um, probably. Yeah, I'm sure you could uh, break that down somehow. Like uh, the fact that the music tends to be a little bit less accessible in the first place, you know, means mm. that you could probably be less accessible with other aspects of it too. You know, I, I don't know if that's a, if there's like a real clear link there, but I, it doesn't seem like too much of a stretch to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it works on paper for sure. Mm. You know, it's like, especially just, with um, extreme metal being an acquired taste, it's like you're probably more likely to not be a young kid or like to be, um, you know, like you've probably gone through more of life and you're probably more um, developed. Uh, I don't know. That, that sounds kind of weird to say it like that, but it's like um, it doesn't have to be as widely accessible, I guess, in terms mm -hmm. of the types of people you're reaching because they probably have worked their way into this thing already to where they're, um, no more and are more open to things mm. that sounds almost like a weird elitist way to put it which isn't where i'm going with it it's just more like um it just goes in line with the music you know it's like a lot of the tonality of this stuff isn't like obvious or accessible or easily understood either and so it mm. probably um just fits in with that just trying to do something different to break the mold sure it's an acquired taste yeah yeah okay and it's a lot of that is in context of more accessible simpler music being appealing when you're first getting into music, you know, and then as you've gone through that, you, you know, you find, you get more excited by things you haven't heard before. And I, I think that's kind of the root of it. It's like, it's not avoiding simpler stuff because it's bad. It's probably just uh, like part of the point of the genre, I think is just doing things that you haven't already seen and heard. So um, one slight difference that we noticed in, in the way you approach language for archeologists compared to Fallujah is that your lyrics in Fallujah are all written in the present tense, as in lines like, no chance to say goodbye, I'm lost in the evening tide, beyond the edge of the mountain, the sun is rising, casting a subtle glow to the light, the dawn of change, uh, to, to light the dawn of change, excuse me. And you find yourself holding on to obsessions pulling you down and they will haunt you. Uh, while obviously you do have lyrics for archaeologists that are in present tense, there are also many segments in the past tense that add context to events set in the present. So, for example, uh, Serpentine begins with, spitefully, you lied to me and I believed your contrived deceit before surmising that your fangs are deep, uh, in deep and you haunt me while I sleep. Uh, so past to present. Similarly, Falling Apart begins with, you thought you had it all figured out until everything came crashing down. The cracks in your resolve gave way to doubt uh, before shifting to the present in the lines, uh, is this what it's come to, losing sight of what is right above you? And Lucid Dreams begins with, life was a blur, uh, all that ever happened before you shift to the present again in Lucid Dreams of home, I'm losing everything I know. Uh, and this is in Winter's Wake 2, where you fo I followed you and lost my faith. Uh, before shifting to sinking down below desolation and bitter silence pulled me away. Uh, and this pattern of like past into present is something we found on six of the 12 songs lyrics, but is not appearing in Fallujah. So we're wondering, like, were you aware that you were engaging in this pattern? And why do you think you uh, dropped discussions of the past when you started writing for Fallujah? That's interesting. I, I had not noticed that, <laughs> honestly. Um, so yeah, maybe that's because uh, another thing, too, is that like, um, with, you know, what I've done for archaeologists versus what I've done for Fallujah, um, a big part of it isn't, um, the biggest part isn't me trying to separate styles between the project. It's just that Fallujah was more recent and I'm I'm more developed as a songwriter than I was in years past. Um, 
so it's a yeah first of all i guess i would say that it's um you know even though that's not something that i've intentionally uh, changed or moved away from or whatever um it's it's probably just some kind of product of uh how i've changed my writing style over time with fallujah being the most recent version of that but yeah i don't know i um I'm not even sure why. Yeah, I guess it's just something I've naturally <laughs> <laughs> moved into more. <laughs> but now I'm going to be conscious of it, I guess. So I'll be like, <laughs> like, well, I suppose the point of commonality there, right, is your like preference generally for the present tense. So, like, do you think? Do you have any insight as to why you tend to write in the present? No, I've actually never thought about that. I, I would say that the closest thing that I have intentionally thought about is um, writing from like the first person or second person, or, like third person perspective. Mm -hmm. um, but I've I've never really intentionally thought about um or like consciously thought about writing from present versus past tense all right well let's just uh jump into the question we have about perspective then so uh, <laughs> yeah. you know uh we noticed that all your lyrics on archaeologists are in the first person uh with 11 mm -hmm. of the 12 written using i and fallujah eight of the nine are in the first person um, and five of these are the singular I, me, while the other three are in the plural we are. So I guess, yeah, why do you pretend to prefer first person rather than, say, uh, third person? And what effect does this create for the listener? Yeah, I think I think first person isn't even what I prefer. I think it's just um, what's easier to default to because it's like you are yourself. You're seeing things from your own perspective. You're saying mm -hmm. me this, you know, <laughs> I did this, I did that, you know, me, me, me. Um, but it's uh, I've I was actually thinking about this recently that um there's been a couple of times when for whatever reason I sort of switched into like talking about, you know, you like it's speaking to the, uh, the listener almost. And I kind of realized that that might feel more relatable in a way, you know, it's like you're, um, you're listening to a song and it's like talking about itself. I, you know, I did this, I did that. Like you can connect with it, of course, but, um, I almost feel like maybe you connect a little bit more immediately with something that's talking about you. You know, it's like, if you're feeling something in the song is, hitting the nail on the head with uh, what you're going through and he's saying you <laughs> about it, you know, that's, uh, I, I think there's an argument to be made that that has the potential to feel a little more personal for the listener in a weird way, you know? And so that, that's something I have started thinking about actually. And same with like the we tense um, or not tense, but I guess that uh, perspective, um, especially in terms of like on some of these Fallujah songs where we're trying to um, talk about sort of universal themes that are uh, that everybody goes through in some way in their own lives with whatever struggles you may personally connect with um the the we set or perspective just kind of makes sense on that because it's like it's it's not just about me it's meant to be interpreted in a more broad um universal sense so um yeah i guess it's a it's not so much that i prefer the i perspective it's just that i've become more aware of it and um will sometimes intentionally do other things when hmm. you use I, is it usually you, or are you sometimes like embodying a character? It depends. Yeah, I would say that um, it can definitely be both. Yeah, there are definitely times where it's embodying a character, or again, to be honest, it's like I'm I'm not a uh, ashamed of saying this, but like on some of the older archaeologist lyrics, it's like like Serpentine, for example. That I I knew very clearly while I was writing it, like the song isn't really about anything. You know, it's just uh, <laughs> I'm putting together lines that sound cool and they flow, and it, like that'd be cool if you screamed that in a song. <laughs> you know, it's like. I'm a, I didn't really feel any need at the time, especially just with sort of launching this project and just wanting to make songs with it. I was like, I, I don't care about changing somebody's life through lyrics or having them connect. I'm like, I just want something that sounds cool in a song, you know? And um, whether I had a meaning behind things or not, like I just kind of rolled with it, you know? And so some songs were more meaningful than others. But uh, yeah, on, on the newer stuff, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be more conscious and focused on that. I think that's the first time someone's just said one of their songs doesn't have any uh, yeah. <laughs> meaning. Um, is, is that something you could do still? Like, could, do you think you could even, now that you've been writing lyrics for so many times, your perspective has changed, could you sit down and, and write like a song that has, quote, no meaning and, and be oh, satisfied for sure. with it? Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, <Okay>. definitely. <laughs> well, okay, me, okay, I cut you off too early. And be satisfied with it? No, probably not. Okay. But, um, but yeah, I, I can still do that. Because part of it, too, is just like, you know, you... Um, when you're hearing songs or like reading lyrics, like sometimes you know exactly what it's about, but more often than not, you don't. And maybe it's obvious, or maybe you know generally what it's talking about, but um, you don't know the specifics of it. And so it's like, uh, again, with um, with the fact that so much of lyric writing is vague enough for people to sort of project their own specifics onto it, um, just by the nature of that, it's like 
they could be talking about nothing. <laughs> it could sound like something meaningful to you and you mm-hmm. could absorb that and take meaning from it. It's like, it's like, how could you prove <laughs> that it had meaning or not, you know, in mm-hmm. terms of, mm-hmm. uh, or I should say like intended meaning. Cause it's like the, the listener is going to perceive whatever they perceive from it and sure. get whatever they get out of it. And um, sometimes maybe that's, really intentionally set up by the artist and maybe sometimes it's not you know and I, I can think of bands too where it's like the lyrics are intentional but they're conveyed in such a weird abstract way that it's like you have no idea what they're talking about i'm thinking like the mars volta or something where you have no idea on paper what it's about but then um you know maybe you could kind of piece things together but it's presented so just strangely and abstractly that it's not obvious at all but it's like you can still connect with it in whatever ways you think it sounds cool or something you know so um it's like, uh, I don't think it's even wrong to write lyrics necessarily that don't have some actual personal like intention behind them. But um, I, I just find that it does enhance the song when it does. And so I'm making myself not be lazy about that <laughs> nowadays. But that, that's more the point of it, I think. Mm. Well, um, although we've said that you, you do generally like tend towards the first person, um, we notice that there are a lot of yous in your writing, though. Um, there are 63 across songs for archaeologists and 42 in songs <laughs> for Fallujah. Um, nice. <laughs> so, yeah, quite a high high level. Um, so in many cases, um, particularly when you work for archaeologists, the you seems to be in conversation with the I, um, as in lines like, um, after all we've gone through, um, I see nothing but a shadow of you. Uh, spitefully, you lied to me. I can see right through your illusion. If I fall asleep with you, will you wait for me? I can't give you the answers. I followed you and lost my faith. So spread your wings, reborn as you return to me. I'm not a victim of your tragedy. So, like, yeah, what's the source of this patterning? Like, and do the use and eyes like kind of respect, like, kind of represent specific like people, groups, like personas? Yeah, what's the go? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I'd say it. Um you know, it's all over the place, kind of depending on what you're looking at. Like, um, sometimes I'm imagining a specific scenario or specific um, sort of, you know, situation or conversation type of thing, or, um, you know, pushing feelings from one person to another type of thing. Um, uh, Other times, you know, maybe it just sounds more, uh, again, going back to like the old archaeologist stuff, maybe it just sounds more dramatic or (laughs) something, you know, when you're talking in these terms, like you probably create some kind of, uh, some sense of conflict, you know, versus just monologuing, I guess. Um, but then there's other cases too, where like, I think of, um, you referenced one on the Fallujah album, which is from the song Soulbreaker, where um, mm. that song actually does have a, uh, there's a story behind it. There, there's a perspective shift in that song where it's like the sort of the bridge section, the second to last part, um, it starts, it, it's talking from a different character basically. And at the time when we wrote that one, I we were intending that part to be a guest feature and it was sort of like the the bridge section this one heavy part is uh sort of from the perspective of the antagonist in this song and then goes back to the main perspective after that and so like um again just being more conscious with these things nowadays than I was you know five or ten years ago um I, I think things like that are more deliberate um but yeah in the past it would have just been you know, again, sometimes it's serving some kind of story or thoughts I'm having maybe about somebody or some imagined scenario. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Just, it just probably seems more natural with uh, thinking, you know, where it's like you're not just talking about yourself. It's you're having feelings or um, experiences in context of other people. So it makes sense to have this sort of conversational uh, direction to it. So another song on the Fluge album that's kind of distinct is the, is the first song of the album because it's written um, entirely as though it's directed towards the audience uh, with you as in the path you've long followed has led you astray. The years have left you lifeless, but the yearning remains. Um, why did you decide to write this one song on the album without any explicit reference to the first person entirely directing it towards uh, you instead? Yeah, you know, because I guess that one is more about um, like singular personal feelings but that's one where i intentionally pointed it in the you sense or you know i think that one i started writing in both tenses and then that's when i realized i was like these lines where i'm speaking in the you sense they they seem more uh sort of uh impactful or more urgent or something just because it's like it's calling out the listener almost and um that song has a real message of uh it's sort of like um coming to peace with whatever like mistakes or um sort of uh distractions or dark place whatever it is like just 
um, struggles you've gone through in your life, sort of coming to peace with that. And rather than letting it drag you down, using that um, sort of lost time as a way to motivate yourself to make a change. It's, it's sort of like hitting some kind of low point where you're like, I, you know, whatever I'm going through in my life, I need to um, correct this, you know, and like realize I'm at my low point and sort of move up, move up from there. Um, sort of like setting up that theme of rebirth, you know, in other songs. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I do remember on that one when I was, you know, starting out and, and that song, we actually rewrote like two or three times that, that one had by far the most editing. And um, that was, it was my least favorite song on the album for a while. Cause I was, <laughs> I just didn't feel as good about the lyrics and then Scott kind of called it out and felt the same way. And I was like, all right, I don't want to rewrite the song again, but I, I guess we will, <laughs> you know, and then um, it, I think it turned out better for it. But I remember that being a part of the revision too. I was like, these, all the parts I want to keep in the song are all in this sort of you perspective. Mm. And then I thought about why. And yeah, I think it's just because it, uh, it's like, it's, it's almost telling the listener to do something and it just felt more direct to talk to them directly instead of, saying like talking about myself and then they follow that example it's like no you should do this yeah well that makes sense you don't want to open your album with um the song that everyone in the band thinks is the worst song of the album <laughs> right <laughs> it's worth a revision it, time right and it wasn't even that i just had i just associated it with like i was like i don't want to work on that song <laughs> you know, okay. i'm like i'm like mm. i like i feel better about my parts and the other songs and everything and that one was just like oh we gotta finish this song too you know so that mm. that's just a very personal thing i don't think uh I have no idea. I don't think listeners would pick up on that at all. That's just my own baggage. With it, no, you know? no, I get it. Like, yeah. yeah, when you after you revise something enough, you're just like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Yeah, yeah. But then well, you got to I mean, revise it to make it good. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, speaking of like listener responses, though, I mean, have you found that like listeners respond in a particular way? Like, you know, when you're performing these songs that have like a very kind of direct you, like mm. are you pointing towards people in the audience <laughs> and stuff, kind of thing. Like, I don't know. Yeah, it's um. I can't say I've really noticed that, but, but maybe, I don't know. It's like, I imagine that would be more on a subconscious level at best, you know, in terms of like, uh, it's like, can they even tell what I'm saying when I'm like screaming in like a loud <laughs> venue, you know, like maybe, maybe not. Um, maybe, maybe it's nice to think that it would, but yeah, it's hard to say, <laughs> probably, probably hard to measure. <laughs> hmm. So um, two kind of thematic metaphors that we found throughout your lyrics for Fallujah are, um, the first is, uh, light or fire, uh, which appears in the majority of the songs you've written, as in lines like, let the embers of your past shine on the bitter taste of clarity, guide me and let the light bestow on radiant ascension, uh, which it, the name itself, of course, uh, references light. Uh, the sun is rising, casting a subtle glow on embrace oblivion, beneath the fading light on eventide, a moving image in the dying flame on Soulbreaker, and the setting suns of tomorrow and artifacts. Uh, what does light do for you as a metaphor, and why do you think you keep come uh, keep returning to it as, as part of your uh, lyrics? Yeah, there's probably a couple different uh, sort of layers to it. Like, because one is that I, I do try to incorporate sort of visual language where I can, just in the sense of like, I, I just find it to be more striking or more interesting when, uh, when, when it just puts some kind of image in your head, you know, like very clearly, you're like you're imagining some kind of scene or, um, you know, just it gets your, it gets your imagination going more. I think when you have like very um, sort of just open, like, uh, visual sort of imagery so that that's part of it is that like you know that's it's like a bold image of like a flame or light or dark whatever you know it's like um and, and i think it's it's too it's a, like you said it does fit in sort of a metaphorical sense where like a lot of this album when, when we're talking about these themes of rebirth it's about you know being in the darkness and finding the light um in, in whatever sense you know just uh it's like a more interesting way of thinking about going from bad to good you know going from dark to light just um naturally feels more i don't know just visually interesting i guess and so it, i think it was partially just natural and partially um going with this uh, sort of intended you know dark to light kind of metaphor well yeah that's something you've actually mentioned a few times now throughout this interview i mean is it odd to work in positive images of light in a genre that's generally known for dark and evil posturing um not so much because I, I think that's been um because you know there are plenty of bands that don't do that so it's like yeah it's definitely not a given in the genre but um i, I think there's enough examples of it before even in other fallujah stuff because it's like again um if you want to write lyrics that people connect with it's like you want to probably connect not just with uh with their darkness so to speak with like 
um, you know, hard things they've gone through, but also with uh, sort of their wishes or goals or motivations too, you know, in terms of like ending up in a better place. And so I think um, if you have some sort of aspect of that to the narrative of the music, um, I think it's, it can be more appealing from the listener or to the listener in like a, in the sense of relating to the music. Cause um, again, it's like, it relates not just with, uh, with the bad, but also with the desire to reach the good, you know? Hmm. Interesting. So, so um, you think there is like plenty of space for that? So I, yeah, let me reformulate this question. Like, do you think there's any pushback um, against artists like in metal anymore for, for doing this kind of like lyric writing, like for like writing lyrics that are, kind of unambiguously good um i don't think so no i mean I'm, I'm sure there'd be a point where you know if your lyrics are just cheerful the whole time you know it's a bit of a, <laughs> a, bit of a weird tone to juxtapose <laughs> with the music but um but I, I wouldn't say it's gone that far and, and again part of it too is just like these metal genres are so broad now that there's uh you know sort of room for everything to exist and then especially within the context of everything it's like it's like okay we've heard enough of the like sort of um you know, if you, the violent or dark lyrics or whatever, you know, it's, it's probably easy to feel like there's enough bands already doing that. Let's do something mm. a little bit different, a little bit less stereotypical. Um, and I don't even know if that's a stereotype anymore, but that's like, you know, somebody who doesn't listen to death metal, that's like probably the first mm. thing they would think of, right? Is like Cannibal Corpse or something like that. For sure, yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's just, you know, er nobody's trying to uh, just redo everything that's already been done. So I think it just makes sense naturally that things push out into all these different directions. And uh, I think that includes uh, what we're talking about right now too, with having some aspect of positivity in the lyrics, especially in the sense of like positivity in this, in the context of getting through the negativity, you know, it's because yeah. the message is never really just like life is great and everything's easy. <laughs> you know, it's more yeah. like, like we, we went through something and we overcame it. You know, that's, that's more the, the positivity than just uh saying you know things are good <laughs> <laughs> is that a prerequisite do you think for like talking like for creating more positive lyrics is like juxtaposing them with something more negative like because i suppose like what i'm trying to get at here and this is maybe a difficult question to answer is like at what point like lyrics that you know are really positive and you know light and all of those kinds of things like then become kind of too far removed from the metal genre to be recognizably metal at all Maybe. Yeah. And, and, you know, for, for me too, I, I find it's just harder to write like that also without feeling like fake or cheesy. Um, mm. Like it's, I, I think it's harder to write a, like a, a quote, happy song than like a, a sad or angry song. Um, if you don't want it to feel like a, like simple, like party anthem or something, you know, like, <laughs> like it's, it's hard to write genuine, happy lyrics. I find even as like a genuine or, you know, just, more or less happy person it's just like harder to mm. write like that and have it um feel meaningful maybe so just not, because it's simpler maybe there's just like the conflict is um there's just more to say when there's some sort of conflict like in terms of having negativity versus like positivity it's pretty straightforward <laughs> you know so this isn't like a metal restriction this is just like a a restriction i think so yeah but um I mean, like, there are genres, like, I don't know, um, not trying to slander anyone else's music taste, <laughs> but, like, um, like, uh, I don't know, like, like dance anthems and stuff like that. Sure. Seem like, I don't know, for, for, does that all come off to you personally? Again, not like, this is all, all very, very, you know, subjective, but like, does that come off very, very corny to you, kind of the way that's approached sometimes? It, I guess it, it could, because not always, yeah, like, there's plenty of examples where it doesn't feel corny, um. But on average, I guess many times I would say yes, mm. but definitely not always. Cause I can think of uh, plenty of songs that fit the description you just gave that I don't feel like they're too simple or <laughs> corny or whatever, you know, mm. but um, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I'm, and obviously metal does lean a certain way, you know, like even if it's not a full on restriction, it's um, obviously tends way more towards having these aspects of negativity and conflict. Sure. Sure. Okay. Well, yeah, we're Returning kind of like the the themes that we saw in yours, the second kind of metaphor we noticed a lot of is um, 
moving water as in examples of uh, a lifetime in a moment distorted by the waves on radiant ascension, rising tide of strength within on embrace oblivion, uh, the name Eventide, of course, uh, blood raining down on Eden's Lament, purpose being washed away on Soulbreaker. Uh, my nature will nurture every impulse arising from the depths on duality of intent, forever flowing on on artifacts. Uh, and there's also plentiful references to things sinking or being dragged down. Uh, where does this, like, what value does this um, kind of, not, not like just water, but specifically like moving water, waves, um, the flow of things, bring to uh what you're trying to say with your your art yeah you know it's probably just another one of those things that i can't help but um sort of you know lean towards just as a way of uh trying to put more vague feelings into like a more physical um and like visual metaphor you know mm. I, I again i think it just um it just adds sort of a uh a color to the music, I guess. But yeah, it's, I would say it's not something that I've like really intentionally decided on, but I, you're right that I do end up leaning towards that too. Same thing with the images of the flames or the light or darkness or whatever. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a way to like, it's like you don't have to, even though it's talking about something in like a physical or visual sense that you could see in the world, like you don't have to explain to somebody that like sinking down is bad, <laughs> you know, and that <laughs> rising is good. Like sure, it's, sure. um, and and that's probably why it's like, it's it's it just gives ways to um sort of show the listener what you're trying to get across without telling them in the most simplest like terms <laughs> you know so it's probably just the nature of trying to um express things in a more poetic way and probably for the same reason that many other people use these sort of visual metaphors you know it kind of accomplishes the same goals i think I mean, there's there's a ton of different things you could use as metaphors, though. Why do you think um fire and water kind of are something you're drawn to? I don't know. Maybe I just need more. Uh, <laughs> I just need to get outside my own box or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, these are themes that we do see, like, I wouldn't say, like, incredibly often, but, like, often enough that, like, you know, I'd say, like, Wes and I would agree that, you know, they're at least semi-frequent in, in metal lyrics. Like, do you mm -hmm. think there's, like... Um, anything about like you know specifically fire and water that like draws metal lyricists <laughs> to these <laughs> these metaphors? <laughs> yeah, we don't see a, we don't see like flower metaphors or like no. um right you know like butterfly wing. I'm I'm sure we're all getting it from somewhere, and I'm sure most of us probably just aren't conscious of it. You know, like whether um you know because that's like a, these aren't like purely original thoughts that I had in a vacuum, right? It's like, these are, <laughs> these were sort of, um, you know, I picked these up from somewhere. So I don't know if that's from music I listen to or other forms of media or whatever, like, or just the fact that metal is like a, um, the progressive, you know, extreme metal, I would say is like a nerdier than average genre. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, you know, I don't know, maybe we're just uh, watching too much sci-fi or fantasy or, um, listening to music that's influenced by that. Um, <laughs> It's like it's one of those things where it's I don't think I could pinpoint it, but yeah, it's coming from somewhere. <laughs> you know, it's it's I'm sure it's not a coincidence. Hmm. But um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it kind of just uh has worked its way into my sort of um list of tendencies somehow. Okay. Hmm. Well, we've talked a lot about like the kind of trends that we've seen across your songs for Fallujah and Archaeologist, uh, but one song that we thought somewhat stands out, um, you know, on the Empyrean album is uh, Mindless Omnipotent Master. Um, yep. So while most of your lyrics are somewhat vague, as you said, um, lines on this one, like Perpetuated System, Outside Our Control, Built to Uphold Our Reign, Its Methodical Pace is Now Self-Sustained, Soulless, Hulking, Mechanical Beast, Driven by Impulse, Desire, and Greed, Voracious Organism, Enslaved and devouring our young seem pretty direct um like yeah. certainly you don't label the exact system or systems you're critiquing but it's fairly clearly a critique on aspects of contemporary society which bind us and leave little for our future children um so what inspired you to take this approach for this one song um was it difficult to write like via framings like human progress advancing the process of mindless machines um, yeah, great question. And I, um, I was hoping you were asking about that song as soon as you started <laughs> that question. I was like, I'm pretty sure I know which one the outlier is. Got it. Um, and yeah, yeah you, this you is where she nailed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you, you pretty much nailed the concept of that one. Um, you know, and again, I think the, the lyrics and, um, vocabulary in that song just sort of 
um, came pretty naturally from the concept of that one, which uh, that song had a very specific and fleshed out concept that is pretty unrelated to the theme, the rest of the themes on the album, um, which is probably why the, you know, the wording and everything ended up uh, feeling different from the other songs. And yeah, it's just basically about um, the general, I, or just general like man-made systems, whether technological or societal or economical or whatever, um, sort of being, you know, built and designed by humans that um, as time goes on, starts to feel more and more like we're serving the systems and like these systems are sort of driving themselves uh, to some sort of momentum to them. Like just in terms of like the acceleration of technology and uh, just, you know, it's like at a certain point are, you know, things that we um, have as a species have like designed for our own benefit. It's like, there's downsides to some of these things too. And it's like thinking about how do these systems uh, serve our own well-being compared to what they were originally conceived as, you know, and however you want to take that um, with a uh, modern society and technology um, and sort of just uh, imagining that again, very visually like personifying that into some sort of giant um, mechanical beast, you know, as it says in the song that um, sort of represents this thing that we've built that now just pushes itself on with or without us, you know, or will trample us <laughs> as it goes type of thing. And um, with that being such a, like, again, just extreme and sort of violent metaphor, it kind of, um, I, it kind of opened the themes up for a lot of language that I don't always use as often, mm -hmm. but that um, I still was able to sort of relate to and write in a more natural uh, sort of process, even just with a lot of the music that I listened to. Like, we were definitely thinking about Mashuga when we wrote the song, like, just in terms of, um, oh, it's, sure, the type yeah. of it's the type of concept that they touch on all the time. And um, it's like not inspired by any specific Meshuggah thing, but it's just, you know, it's like we're, we're sort of getting closer to this uh, sort of world that they, you know, write a lot of their stuff in. And that's that's one of our favorite bands, too. So, um, yeah, it's a lot of this like really vivid uh, kind of mechanical um, terminology ended up working its way into that one. Hmm. I mean, did you like decide like, I mean obviously we've said that this is like a song that's very distinct from the others on the album. So like, was it like a difficult decision to include a song that's like, you know, at least lyrically speaking, very distinct from the other songs that do have a more kind of consistent through line? Um, not really, because I would say like the, uh, just in terms of the process of putting the album together, like we, we never really intended to have too many recurring themes. It kind of just oh, okay. naturally happened. And mm -hmm. so it's like when we're setting off, like we have all these different ideas for songs. There's a few other songs too that um maybe don't seem as far removed thematically or, or in terms of like the language at least, but um mm. but are in fact pretty separate in terms of like the meaning or themes or whatever. Um, so we were kind of just going a bunch of different directions with the lyrics on, on a song by song basis. But then some of those ended up uh, being closer to each other, you know, and then by that point we realized like, okay, you know, there, there is kind of a common theme here to at least a solid chunk of the album. And, uh, you know, we can kind of lean into that, but, but yeah, it's more like the connection is what grew over time more so than like that one song diverging from the rest. Right. Okay. Let's see. Interesting. So uh, another thing that we've noticed is kind of absent in your lyrics is, um, well, you know, you do mention death and destruction. You don't have any swearing vulgarity or gore. And indeed I think, um, this podcast interview, unless you uh, change your speech style in the yeah. next uh, little bit, is going to end up one of our um, our cleanest in terms of the number of swear words from the person we're interviewing. Decidedly, um, yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, this is this is a PG perhaps uh, episode so far. Our first um, one, maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, like, did you intentionally avoid swearing and gore, or is this something that comes about more organically? Like, do you uh, avoid swearing? personally and what do you think would have happened if you had added like you know a few uh swear words into your lyrics yeah that's, that's funny i've I, I know that about my stuff but i've never had somebody ask that <laughs> i know you know um yeah it's a uh, i mean it's it's not something that i like hold myself to in my personal life by any means at all you know mm -hmm. i think it's just something that i don't end up resonating with as much lyrically you know and um, there's exceptions that like i can think of plenty of bands that i do love the lyrics and have plenty of swearing or whatever mm -hmm. but um yeah, just it's kind of naturally started working like that from early on to where I just felt like I 
it, often it felt like that would have been like a, a cheaper way to express what I was trying to express mm -hmm. or like a more, again, this isn't like um, exclusive, but like many times can seem more like a more juvenile way to express what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and that's by no means a rule because again, it's like, I can think of plenty of bands where that's not the case at all. Um, where again, it's like, they can use this, they can use swearing as a way to um, uh, bring in these like just real dark or not even dark, just like, sort of like gritty sort of um, aspects to the music, you know, like, um, like for some reason, the first one I think of is like every time I die, that's, which is my favorite um, band in terms of lyrics. And it's like, they, they don't shy away from that at all. You know, it's just like, it just makes the music seem really um, kind of like gritty and grounded, I guess. But uh, I don't know. Yeah. It's just never something that I really felt like I needed to lean on to express what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And then I wouldn't want it to, um, I don't know. I, I wouldn't, it's just not not the vibe I'm going for for whatever reason, and that's that's not like a hard rule either necessarily. It's not like I will never do this. I've just never really felt compelled to. What would change if if you were to add swear words? Do you think? I guess we get one of those cool stickers on our album, for, uh, <laughs> explicit content. But uh, do those still exist? I don't know. Actually, yeah. Now that you mentioned it, I haven't seen one in a while. Maybe like maybe nobody uh, oversees it. <laughs> uh, not, not sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's like, it's hard to say. I, I don't think it would affect things too much. Cause it's not like we have, a. I don't think like a big chunk of our audience are like kids or anything, you know, so <laughs> I, I don't think we'd like alienate our listeners, but, um, yeah, I don't know. And, you know, now that I think about it, I'm trying to, uh, I can't think of many or any examples of swearing in old Fallujah lyrics either. There, there's probably mm. a couple, but like none that are really coming to mind for me. No, when I had a look, there's not, there's minimal to um yeah i can't think of any examples yeah yeah i can't think of any either so it's it probably just aligns with it just um that's some of the thing i guess too is like it, it seems like if if you're keeping a more serious vibe with the music which i would say we are it's like that um that can kind of uh break the um what's the word i'm looking for it, it can kind of like take you out of that i don't know whatever sort of world you're trying to put the listener in i think mm. Does it shift too much into the colloquial then, do you think? Maybe, yeah, and maybe that's exactly it, yeah. And maybe it's a little too colloquial to where it, like, it's the type of language that you would um, hear more in ordinary life, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and less in, like, uh, I mean, it's like you're looking at, like, like the album cover for Empyrean. It's like it sets the sort of precedent that this is some sort of, like, sci-fi fantasy type of vibe to it, you know? Like, it's, mm -hmm. it's not some guy going about his daily business, you know? It's like it's kind of this otherworldly thing. And that's, I would say that's very worldly. <laughs> like, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, that's, if, if I had to break it down, like, and again, that's not something that I've like thought about consciously, but now when I try to analyze it, it's, you know, I, I think those are some of the reasons. Hmm. So as your kind of tenure with Fluge is just beginning, uh, do you have a sense of where you want to go lyrically in the future? Like how do you see your lyrical approach developing as you begin working with this band? And do you anticipate moving, you know, further away from what you did with archaeologists? Is there a desire to keep them like, uh, I suppose, distinct in a way? Um, not too worried about keeping them distinct. Um, I would say that like, first of all, with uh, Empyrean's been out for almost a year now and we you know, recorded it pretty much a year before that. Um, but I, I still, feel really good about the lyrics on that one so it's I, I don't feel any strong sense to like oh, i gotta get away from that and you know do something else like um i i think that for the next release i will want to um fully commit to having a more focused uh sort of theme or concept to it um and we're we're, we're still in the early stages of new stuff and i'm playing with different ideas for that but I, I think i will hold myself to having one sort of connecting thread between everything on the album um, so that, that'll be kind of like a fun challenge for myself on the future stuff. But that's that's vague enough to like I couldn't I haven't decided on what that's going to be yet. You know, I have like a couple of different options that I'm trying to decide between. But um, yeah, like I, lyrically, I, I don't see myself uh, right now. I don't have any desire to go some totally different direction with it. Um, but I, I do want to definitely stay because uh, again, like Empyrean, I was kind of saying was like definitely feels like the most thoughtful and intentional and meaningful lyrics I've done. And I definitely don't want to backtrack on that. You know, so um, I think I'll hold myself to that same standard in the future as far as, you know, having something to say with songs and not letting it just be about nothing, you know, or let the listener figure it out. Um, but, but yeah, you know, and I think uh, I'll just keep those same 
sort of goals in mind and then see where things develop from there. Hmm. Well, looking back in the opposite direction um, and drawing together kind of your, our exploration of your work across your solo project and with Fallujah, what would you say is ultimately the role of lyrics in your work and in the extreme metal genre more broadly? I mean, so again, it's like my relationship that has kind of changed over time. Like um, when I started Archaeologist, it, it felt like I was I was writing lyrics because I wanted to have vocals. You know, it was like, I, was like, mm -hmm. I want to sing on this song. I'm like, I don't care what it's about. I just want to have vocals and I, you can't sing without words <laughs> you know mm -hmm. um at least not for very long <laughs> and so uh you know it kind of started more from that where it was like um honestly an afterthought on some of the earlier stuff and not always it's like even back then i was like oh this is something cool i want to write about but um it wasn't the priority you know it's like i would make the song whether or not i had a clear uh meaning behind it um but uh over time yeah it's become more important i think too it's like uh lyrics are and vocals as a whole are just something that uh, it's a chance to really um, have people connect and relate to the music more in the sense that like, um, you know, th there's a lot of guitar centric music that I love that I probably wouldn't have as strong feelings about if I didn't play guitar or know what was going on in that sense. And so there's a lot of music like that where it's like, not that you have to play guitar to enjoy it, but that you're, you're more likely to appreciate it on, on another level if you do. Um, and so, you know, then it's like, some aspects of the music are more likely to be enjoyed by musicians or guitar players. Whereas lyrics, it's like everybody can read and write and like have thoughts and feelings and conversations, you know? So it's like, um, just the, the format of it or just the, on a very inherent level, I think lyrics can be more relatable even to the entire circle of people that aren't involved with music, you know? So it's, it's like keeping that in mind, there's kind of a potential there to, um, again, just connect with more people or have more people uh, relate with your music on a deeper level. And so um, there's kind of a responsibility that comes with that, too, is what I've felt more over time. You know, it's like it's almost a waste to not do that because it's like the downside is that writing with a lot of intention and meeting um, takes more effort and more time and more, you know, more thought. Uh, but the, there's no downside to it beyond that. It's like if your song is going to sound <laughs> cool either way, it's like, why would you not? try to have meaningful lyrics on top of that, you know, or, or at mm. least tell, not that it has to be a, uh, you know, meaningful, whatever that means to you, you know, like whether you just want to convey some kind of emotion or whatever. So, yeah, I, I would say it, it, it has become more important to me over time as a writer to where it's something that I would probably take for granted in the past, even when I was, you know, reading lyrics and enjoying lyrics and having lyrics mean a lot to me. It, I kind of realized more, I'm like, why would I ever waste a chance to do that in my own stuff? You know? Hey, okay. Yeah, awesome. right on. Make, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we also wanted to ask, um, you know, considering that we've like reached the end of our pre-prepared questions, if there's any question um, that you were hoping that we would ask that we <laughs> did not ask? <laughs> um, Not really, no. I mean, yeah, you, you guys uh, brought up a lot of interesting stuff I didn't expect to or had <laughs> never thought about before. <laughs> <laughs> we get that a lot yeah yeah, yeah. cool yeah glad glad to hear it so um when this episode comes out you'll you'll have just come back from australia hopefully we'll have um you know seen you uh on stage uh mm -hmm. that's the plan yeah yeah, and, uh, I'm, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm always doing merch for us too so come, come oh, say sick. hi by all means i'm easy to find at the show absolutely shows. Oh, great absolutely. yeah, yeah. yeah. we'll yeah. do yeah so we'll have yeah by the time this has come out we'll already have uh have met each other you know multiple yeah. times um <laughs> what's uh what's next what's what's gonna be you know uh what's on the the table for the rest of the year uh you said there's new stuff in the works right is that yeah yeah so we're um we're chipping away at new Fallujah stuff it's like we haven't really gotten um into like we, we've done some really pre preliminary sorry, <laughs> preliminary thought on the yeah. uh sort of vocal content and lyrical content but you know it's we're still working on instrumentals for now but um yeah we're chipping away at new Fallujah stuff um I pretty much always have some kind of archaeologist stuff in the works and some projects I've been trying to finish up for years. So I'll be working on that stuff. Um, I have a, that video game soundtrack I was doing for archaeologists is kind of the next thing on my plate to where it's, uh, it's, I, I had like an incomplete version come out with the beta version of the game, but I want to add more music to that game and release the, you know, quote, full version of the soundtrack. So that's sort mm -hmm. of the very next thing I'll be working on. Which game is this? Um, it's called Duelist. Okay. Um, it's a, or it was called Duelist, and it's a, it's a game that I played a lot and actually took a lot of uh, archaeologists' song titles from, um, including Winner's Wake and a lot of the instrumental stuff. 
And then the game got shut down and uh, basically wiped from existence. And now I'm doing music for this uh, sort of new, um, you know, th th sort of a remake, sort of a sequel. It started as like a volunteer fan project, but now has the full rights to uh, sort of carry on the Duelist name. So it's Duelist 2, which is, uh, you know, came about because the old one died. <laughs> so I'm making, I'm making music for that. Okay, cool. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's like a pretty niche, like, indie kind of game, but um, it's one of those games with, like, a small but very committed <laughs> fan base, you know, which I was part of, so kind of jumped at the chance to work on that when I heard they were trying to revive it. Awesome. Well, where's the best place to keep up with um, all of your projects, releases, all of your work? Um, anywhere. You know, I, I try to spread my stuff to all of the uh, places somebody would usually think to look, you know, so Instagram, Facebook, um, you know, Spotify, Bandcamp, whatever for uh, new music. But um, yeah, everywhere. You know, it's like if, uh, if, if I'm not spreading the word on some other platform that people would go to look for, then uh, I'll try to change that. <laughs> Okay, great. So no yeah. clear preference or anything? <laughs> no, not really, honestly. Okay. No, it's like I, I I tend to use Spotify mostly for music, so that's more what I see and I'm aware of. <laughs> you know, like I don't even know how many people are listening to my music on some other platforms like Apple Music or whatever. Um, and I tend to be, I guess I'm not big on Twitter, but I tend to be active on Instagram and Facebook. So one of those, I guess, you know. <laughs> cool. Or well, the, we'll have uh, those. Sorry, you go ahead. I would say, or, or, or follow me on Bandcamp if you really want the yeah. uh, like email updates, because that, that's one that I do use a lot as well. Okay. Awesome. Well, we will have those links in the description. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. This was a lovely chat with you. Yeah, thank you, guys. This was a cool uh, cool interview. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. We hope so. Yeah, given yeah. <laughs> how much of your time that we suck up, we hope that that's yeah. the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> The ultimate, uh, the ultimate takeaway. I, I've never had somebody tell me that I used uh, sixty-two eyes and many, uh, <laughs> yeah, or sixty-two U's and however many eyes in my music before. So that's cool to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we're, we're giving you the actual the stats, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 And now, if anyone asks, if anyone wants you to know, say, yeah, you can yeah. point to this resource. <laughs> right. Yeah. Bar trivia: How many eyes are used in uh, the last Fallujah album? It's like, got right. it. <laughs> yeah. right. Now it's official. Yeah. Official. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, man. Take care. And um, yeah, look forward to look forward to catching you live. Yeah, yeah definitely. I'll see you guys in a few weeks, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy the uh, the flight is miserable. Enjoy it. <laughs> That's what I've heard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, hope you enjoy um your your time in Australia. Have you been before? No, it's my first time. So okay, um, Fal awesome. Fallujah has gone once before, but it was mm. in like 2016 or 2017 before mm -hmm. I joined. Okay. So um, yeah, definitely my first time. Okay. Well, hope you enjoy it. As an Aussie, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Thanks. No, it's good. Uh, it's good down here. Yeah, it can't be too bad. I'm sure it'll be. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure, I'll have a good time. Yeah. What do you guys? You got Mel Melbourne, Sydney, Perth. Um. Yeah. Uh, Brisbane. Gonna, yeah. Brisbane. Oh, okay. Yeah, Brisbane. I was gonna say I'm. I'm almost scared to say what cities to mispronounce all of them. Oh, I do it all the time. <laughs> um, it's fine. Uh, Canberra. Canberra. <laughs> Canberra. Canberra. Yeah. yeah. Canberra and yeah. Um, Adelaide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so okay. I you're doing. Well, yeah. You guys doing the. You're the, hitting all the major cities. Yeah. Whole, yeah. 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 Most people and just do Melbourne, Sydney, and then leave. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, as someone I, who lives in Perth, I very much appreciate you coming to Perth. <laughs> yeah, I've had a couple of people say that from Perth. I guess, mm. I, I mean, you know, I don't know what it's like over there, but I guess uh, apparently not as many bands come through there. So it's cool. Yeah, it's rough uh, out here. Yeah. So glad we yeah, can yeah. make it then. <laughs> yeah. And then we're, we're doing um, two shows in Melbourne, actually, too. Okay. We mm. have one with uh, Cattle Decapitation, and then we added an additional headlining show after that. Um, I think because the first one sold out and it seemed like there was still more potential to it. Uh, you know, obviously, it's like, we're paying for this whole trip over there. We got to make the yeah. most out of it all we can and try to play yeah, some 100%. shows and make some of that money back, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, we, we did add a headlining show in Melbourne at the end of it as well. All right, cool. Well, all right. looking forward to it. Yeah. 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 yeah same. <laughs> Take care, bro. Right, Thanks. Well, cool. Well, thank you guys. Yep. Thanks so much. All right. See you later. Thank you for listening to Lingua Rutalica. We hope you enjoyed it and we hope you stay tuned for our next episode. Before we leave, we just wanted to acknowledge that this podcast is recorded on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay respects to their elders, past and present.